Welcome to the Archaic Drum Podcast. Today, we'll be speaking with Jack O'Keefe. Jack was raised in rural Ireland with a yearning to know more about the concept of a god. She studied theology and music, with her studies culminating in her leaving school, disillusioned and a non-believer. She then began a career interweaving community development with the arts. In 1997, she had an experience that would dramatically change her life. She developed and delivered holistic programs that focused on viewing depression as a spiritual awakening rather than a biochemical disorder. Her personal quest led her to that which is beyond the mind, a transcendence of the dualistic thought. She now facilitates spiritual gatherings in a question-and-answer format in both Europe and the United States, offering clear pointers to those with a yearning to discover who they really are as human beings. Well, Jack, I'm not so sure how I missed you out there in the world, but I just discovered you a couple of weeks ago. I began the usual process I go through uh, for preparing for these talks, but after going through some of your videos and audios, I came to the conclusion that perhaps no one needs any preparation to see that which you are pointing towards. Um, That said, I do have some things scribbled down here so I don't become lost along our little journey here. Mm -hmm. Well, Jack, what do you say we attempt to get to the bottom of something here? Perhaps there is no bottom or even a top for that matter. So I understand you you grew up a a good Guinness swilling Irish girl Mm -hmm. and then you ended up in a Catholic seminary studying theology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then leaving that as more or less screaming disillusioned atheist. When you were in your 20s, you had a rather rumble-tumble lifestyle, I understand, as many of us have done as well. Why don't we begin there? What was going on for you at that time before this first big event in your life took place? Yes. Uh... There was an intensity, which is still part of the Jack character, uh, but it applied to every aspect of life. And so, so there was a belief, you know, that youthful belief that you can change the world through, you know, merging the arts and education. This was my gig. And I ended up thinking that actually, if arts organizations were more business-like, the merging uh, and the access of what the arts can offer, creative expression, nonverbal communication, maybe that can go someplace else. And so I ended up from being an employee to being an arts consultant. And so I was, you know, heading off around there, working the 32 counties of Ireland, trying to, trying to make a difference, make a change. And in the middle of all of this, uh, there was some gnawing dis-ease mm-hmm. about who I was and my perspective on the world. And I kept seeing that the more experiences I have, the more different organizations I work for, even if I took my work, the more friends, different types of friends that I have, the more I travel, the more my conditioning is changing. So I keep absorbing conditioning, but there's all this old garbage. Mm-hmm. And so I started um, to try and get my head sorted out while I was in university. And it continued on. And looking back, that eight years of intensive therapy, intensive talking therapy, usually psychotherapy, it was a savior in order to get a handle on how mind worked. Mm -hmm. That really, really was the most influential thing of the most um, foundational 
peace for the rest of the Jack character's life that was put in place in my 20s, for sure. It was the diligence around going to to therapy, around unpacking and healing the the wounded child. Mm -hmm. Um, That was really important, looking at the whole thing. Uh, But then, you know, of course, there was a lot of, you know, taking hallucinogenics, anything at all, anything to just to get out of the mindset. And I was like, I have to change this. I can't keep just using whatever I can to, to, to get away from it. I've got to go back in here and clean up this house. So, so that, that was the lifestyle really, you know, you know, uh, until, until my third eye opened and I saw spirits everywhere and I'm just like, okay, I'm tripping. Somebody's giving me something. I'm definitely tripping here because this stuff isn't real. But of course it, it was real within the illusion, you know? Well, I know you've probably told this story a, a thousand times, but what happened that day and how did it progress for you? Yeah. It was, it was literally a Sunday lunch where there were, uh, I don't know, six, eight of us. Um, um, and in the middle of lunch, it, uh, there were dead people just hanging from the ceiling, mostly in the shape of Casper, that's stereotypical, because, because now I understand that that's the only way that my mind could turn it into an image, mm-hmm. because there was an, energe- an energetic intelligence in, in, in front of me, but the image was Casper. And so then as fear arose, the image changes and it becomes a grotesque person, a corpse that's half rotted, you see? And so mm-hmm. now there's an understanding, of course, that the mind the brain will put up an image because when the mind brings information, there's, everything is, is there all the time. How the matrix works, the truth, it's just sitting there all the time, but we miss it mm-hmm. because we have these filters in place that, that help us to survive. Yeah. And this, you know, and this is, this is, you know, I suppose has been transcended in some cultures and a lot of, you know, non-dual speakers will say, not at all, you don't have to move the conditioning. No, you don't have to move the conditioning to see the truth. Mm-hmm. But in order to, to allow the truth only to motivate every moment to, to be the thing that breathes through your form, to allow that to be unencumbered by filtered of how you think the world, of the character's obstacles to this beautiful vision of what is, Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if these things aren't removed, there will be, there will be an, uh, a series of obstacles still in place. Yeah. One can use the mind and say, well, <clears throat> if you know it's an illusion, it doesn't matter. And of course it doesn't matter. Nothing really matters. But there is a pull of consciousness which moves through the form to remove conditioning, to remove erroneous beliefs, to remove beliefs that you don't even know that are running on a subconscious level. But as I suppose as one's personal integrity, as honesty gets deeper, as those virtues get deeper, there is a seeing that, hey, you know, I'm full of crap here, actually. There's something running. The truth is being seen, but the character is full of crap. And, and there must be space for that, to, to allow that peeling back of the character so that so that there's no obstacle, no filter, obscuring uh, the verbalization of that which is prior to what can be verbalized. Uh-huh. So way back then, 15, 17, 18 years ago, the filters was what I was after. And there was no sense of anything beyond the filters. So when the third eye opened, it was like, whoa, whoa, I mean, here comes a new belief system. Or this turns my atheistic belief system upside down. You know, there wasn't an opening to monotheism for years. I had to come back to it by another route. So the filters were just taken down. They were taken down. It's like, whoa, everything I know actually mightn't be right at all. And it's funny because there was a bus route that I used to take um, when I was in university and and written on a wall as the bus used to pull out from Dublin city centre to where the university was, was everything you know is wrong. It was graffiti on an old... Uh rugged wall you know and it stayed in my head for years everything you know maybe maybe everything I know is wrong and I had no place to put it 
But that day that that the spooks started appearing and the, the other dimensions were all of a sudden just available, maybe everything I know I've taken to be real is wrong. Everything, everything actually could be opposite to what I think. All right. So instead of wanting to, well, well, you know, how do I get this right? Or what's the politically correct? Or what's the, mm-hmm. what's the balanced view? Yeah. There, there came an opening to see that, you know, maybe even the parts that are healed, the parts that are balanced and okay and can manage in the world, maybe they're full of crap also. Mm-hmm. Maybe. And so a great shaking of the walls that had become the stability because at that point there was a sense of actually okay I, I i need to feel okay and love myself and accept the jack character and this fight might stop yeah um the self-criticism might stop those kind of things and of course they did as the healing happened all of that happened of course it does <clears throat> but moving on from that it's like hmm somehow that's not enough either self-love is in place everything is in place But this isn't enough either. So what do I know, perhaps, though I think I know, that is now a conditioning at another layer that's not upsetting and aggravating to mind, but what else is in place at another layer Mm -hmm. that is an assumption, a cultural assumption, a a human assumption? How how deep can we dig? And so this started another layer of inquiry without having that language at the time. But it started another layer to see, to see wh- where does this go? Is there actually anything at all to be found anywhere? Um, and it was plant medicines that really, really helped getting involved in shamanic work just to access that other layer, to, to discover that, that what I saw with hallucinogenics could be managed through ayahuasca or peyote or whatever else was around, mm-hmm. you know, to, to have it managed and held so that I can use this for healing. That was just such a gift, you know? Well, I found this to be a rather interesting part of your journey. I mentioned this in the last show that just about a year ago, I made a trip down to the Peruvian rainforest myself and participated in a series of ayahuasca ceremonies which changed my life in in some ways. And some years earlier, I had uh, acquired an interest in finding some relation between Buddhist and Eastern philosophies and uh, shamanic traditions. So um, I would be interested, um, though, in hearing about your own experience with these shamanic plant medicines and if they were an influence at all uh, in your own growth process or awakening. Yes. It gave a huge, offered a huge amount of understanding of how the matrix works, of how it's put together, of how if something is ingested in the body that it can alter perception. So, so isn't it just that we have a, a societal norm which says what is normal is common perception? That's clear because you go to another culture and you are not okay at all having your social norms from your own culture. It's like it's not accepted. It's like, whoa, okay. So common perception is just an agreed modality of behavior. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so who says when I'm sober, for want of a better term, I don't know what the right phrases when i'm sober really really is that is that really real or is this just what we've agreed to call to call normal which of course all it is is just an agreement you know to to make functioning happen because we pull together in communities we we function with other people Mm -hmm. we're you know wired to connect with people so so there there is a place for all of it and this this might be just to the side but there, there, you know, there are um, writings in scriptures from the East which say you, you stick to one path and you keep working through the obstacles. And that absolutely is true, but it's of its time. Mm-hmm. Because when there were just gurus in the traditional form available, 
then to jump from one to the other, of course, is just entertainment for the mind because it's something new and it's something fresh and it's a fresh distraction. Right. Of course. But looking now at the diversity of how our lives are, of how we can, mm, we can have influences from so many different places, especially with the coming on of the, inter the internet and travel. These are the two things really that have made it so much broader that the, the, our perception is influenced by a very wide spectrum. Yeah. And so, yes, and so following one path, I, I just don't feel it's that appropriate anymore. Mm -hmm. I just don't. You know, and I've seen it satsang when, when, when somebody comes up and says, Jack, you know, like, I need to hear it in a fresh way. And it's like, yes, go, 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 mm -hmm. <laughs> go. You know, it's wonderful that they've exhausted something. And, 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 and genuinely, not from a place of seeking distraction, but from a place of it's dry, it's dry. Something new is needed, a fresh yeah. viewpoint, new words, a, a new angle, point from a new direction. And thank heaven, you know, it's it's like... It, it, thank heaven we can do it without leaving home. You can go on the internet and find something new, you know, and if you have to travel, you have to travel. Fine. Yeah. Um, but it's it's part of of the evolution of of the industrial age, really. It's mm -hmm. it's I I it's appropriate for very few now, I think, to actually stick to the one path the whole way. And it's it will be a dying tradition. It will be a, a traditional path that not many will follow. Mm -hmm. You know, because our influences are too diverse. Yeah, it's true. Mm. Do you think, though, Jack, mm. in light of the vast density of information that's available for us today and the vast spectrum of possibilities we have of retrieving that information, do you think that it might be a challenge for some people to uh, keep some sort of foundation or focus for themselves? Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And this is where the immature mind and the mature mind, not to put any judgment on it because there, it's, it's just a movement of conscious. There's nothing you can do about it. But the thing is to be honest, to be honest and say, hold on a minute, am I, am I jumping around because I'm, not, I'm scared to commit to something and actually leaving something because it's exhausted? You've exhausted it. That's the time to leave something. Not because, oh, this is more interesting. That there's an inner resonance um, which the mature seeker can use as a discernment. But the immature seeker will look for evidence to dismiss. Mm -hmm. So the, the mature seeker, okay, we've spoken about that, something is exhausted. The immature seeker will say, oh, they shouldn't have said that. Oh, no, 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 they, they, that's not the truth. Somebody wouldn't behave like that if they've seen the truth. That's the immature seeker. Mm -hmm. Because mind in the immature seeker will always look for evidence to support the promotion of more illusion. No. It will find evidence to leave somebody. So if you've got a rational mind reason for, no, 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 I don't like that anymore. That, that stinks. It's like, okay, okay, okay. It actually push through that. That's you. That's your own projection mm -hmm. because mind will find evidence. And that's the immature seeker. So the thing is to, you know, to recognize is, is your seeking come from a mature place or an immature place? So jumping from one or, or drifting from one to one, one source of, of, of pointings, I suppose, pointers to another, that, that can go on forever because there's no actual work done. There's no pushing through what the issues are, you know? So one has to drive their own ship until they see, oh my God, it's being driven from someplace else. Whoa, it's coming from someplace else. You know? Jack, could you tell us a little bit more hmm. um, about your experience with this plant, ayahuasca? And how was it an influence for you, if any, hmm. along your own path? Um, yes, I suppose with, with the development of a third eye, um, there was a lot of communication from, from, I don't know, another part of my own mind, really. But you can say other dimensions, other realms or visions or whatever. So I very much trusted those visions because I knew that I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue here. So, so 
there was trust in something. And sometimes it led me astray and sometimes it didn't. With, with plant medicine, um, there, there was a, a window opened whereby the workings of mind, the workings of perception, mm-hmm. the back end of a website, you know, <laughs> it's like the back end of something, yeah. you know, uh, where the film is being shot was shown. And then increasingly, those seeings happened when I was sober. Okay. I was like, whoa, oh my goodness. Okay, it's, I don't need the medicine anymore to break through into, into how the matrix works. Yeah. Um, whether it be that, oh, you know how it works, you know different perceptions, you see through things, or um, oh, there's a gazillion ways, ways it can happen around, uh, you know, you see the energy field around, around a door, and it's fine seeing it around trees and animals, but around a door, it's like, whoops, okay, I would mm-hmm. see this if I was on medicine, but there it is. <laughs> so, so, <clears throat> The, the the sense of of what plant medicine could offer and where my own perception was the distance narrowed it narrowed and so there was a knowing of actually no at this point now i remember the last trip actually it was a peyote ceremony in bolivia mm-hmm. and at the end of it there was um uh, just a knowing of okay if i stay doing this now it would be for entertainment. It would be just see what, what else, what else, what else can, can be presented by mind. Mm-hmm. I've learned all I can learn. Now it's just going to be entertainment. So I'm cutting it. I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. Um, and once I did that and I spent the ceremony doing that and saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. But I, I'm done. You're throwing me out and I'm graciously saying, thank you. I'm gone. And uh, just this figure appeared and said, it's time to look at the East. Stop looking at the West. It's like mm-hmm. the East, bloody hell! Could you be more specific? You know, but two years later, I was in India. You know, so um, a, a thing that happened on Sancto Daime medicine, actually, and this was in Ireland, um, and it's it's a Brazilian medicine that's very largely available in Holland because it's actually recognised as a church in Holland. Mm-hmm. And on Sancto Daime, as a result of taking that, I don't know if it was during the ceremony or after the ceremony. But that huge vacuum took place of where everything stable, everything was stripped. Mm -hmm. And so there was a total knowing from there, which never reassembled itself, that actually whatever I can cling to, whatever I think is solid is not solid, no matter what the dimension, no matter where, if I go to the from the Dalai Lama to Jesus Christ or my husband at the time or, you know, an oak tree in the garden. Mm -hmm. All of it actually is only solid because I'm imagining it's solid. So that brought up huge fear. And it's like, okay, now we're into the fear realm. There's a story which might or might not be valid, but we're into fear now. Um, and, And that broke something in the Jack character. That broke something. It's just like, actually, really... Is there anything here that is real at all? Is there anything that exists here at all? Is it just held together by an idea, an idea that, that, that has never been questioned? Mm-hmm. And because there is a localization of perception through the body, that idea is saying that I am perceiving this glass of water. So the localization is just an idea. Perception is happening through this form. Whether or not I'm owning that perception, perception is just happening through this form. And so once I was, or there was a willingness, I suppose, to to see that there's only fear keeping together this Jack character as an individual. There's only fear keeping her together at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, when she became whole, there was love keeping her together. And then it turned upside down and there was fear keeping her together later, you know. And so, so from that, it's like, okay, all right, then, do you know what? There's nothing. There's just nothing. Now, this was a few years before I discovered uh, the non-dual language. I had no language for this. And anybody I would say to, actually, recently, um, a few months ago, the last time I was back in Ireland, <clears throat> I met an old friend, and she, she 
she, she, she's a homeopath and she wouldn't have any connection with, with the non-dual world. She tried to reborn to be free and she thought, yeah, that's what you're doing now, isn't it? That's interesting. It's like, hmm, okay. <laughs> she read it intellectually and that's fine, of course. You know, it's like mm-hmm. different folks and different strokes. Oh, and I <clears> did <throat> forget to mention your book. Excuse me. You're fine, you're fine. Yes. Uh, so, so for somebody who just couldn't, couldn't go, hasn't gone in there, she just said, you know, the funniest laugh I ever had when I was living close to you, because we lived very close. Funniest laugh is that one day she said, you were coming home when it was about six o'clock in the morning and I was outside farming. She's a farmer. Mm-hmm. And you saw me on the road and you pulled in the car, pulled in the side and you said, you know what, Liz, you know what? It's all an illusion. And she said, I've laughed ever since. It's like, oh, there's Jack. She just says it's all an illusion. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's funny. It's like, gosh, I had that language. That language was there after a ceremony. It's all an illusion. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and she still just sees it as a funny thing that I said once upon a time, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, okay. And I left it go, of course, you know, as if like, yeah, wasn't it silly that I thought that once? But of course, of course, like, what do you do, you know? What yeah, do you do? Yeah. You know, mm. but in, in India, it, it was like, I suppose, listening when I went to Truvanama line, there's a lot of satsang available there. Um, this is a mountain uh, in India where is. the great saint Ramana Maharshi lived. Is that correct? Ramana Maharshi. That's right. That's right. It's, it's really a very sacred place. And it's become a little bit of a spiritual supermarket, you know, mm-hmm. you know, but but before it really turned into that, um, uh, yeah, there were some interesting speakers there. And also the reading, the writings of Ramana Maharshi, it was like a checklist. It was like, yeah, yeah, oh my God, there's language for this. Mm-hmm. And then click, 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 click. And once the understanding came in, I suppose another level of breakdown came, which seems to have been irreparable. It's like five or six years ago now, and it's mm-hmm. it's never played as real since. And it might. It might all glue back together again and the movie might appear as real. It, it'll do what it'll do. You know, it's fine. It's fine either way. And you ended up uh, in India by um, invitation from some friends. Is that correct? Yeah, I was with a, a guy at the time, actually, who... who um, uh, I had just left my marriage. I had just walked away from everything in Ireland. And I spent, um, yeah, I spent a bit of time with him and he just said, I I have to learn how to do yoga, how to be a yoga teacher. And I was like, well, nothing else to do. I have no place else to go. And hey, you know, there was a suggestion of going to the East. So, okay, yeah, let's do it in India. Mm -hmm. To study some yoga. And on the second day of the course, it was like, this sucks. I'm not interested in this at all. (laughs) And so the local town of the course was Ramana Maharshi's town. It was Tiruvannamalai. It was, it was just a place a few miles, five or six miles from Tiruvannamalai, you know? Were you aware that you were so close to this so-called holy place no. when you arrived? No. No, I knew, yeah, it's a sacred place, but the sacred place is everywhere. There was no resonance at all with what I, I was just going to the local town to wait mm. for four or five weeks till my friend got, got out of boot camp, you know? So, <laughs> so, you know, and I was like, oh, wow, oh, wow, look what I found. Oh, wow, I'm so glad I left that course. Oh, thank heaven, you know. Uh, and, and gosh, I just got lost there for a few years, wonderfully lost, and didn't never find myself again, you know. <laughs> uh-huh. Jack, was there sort of a realization that came to you while you were there through a gradual process, or were you just smacked in the head one day? I think the big smacks had happened. Um, there was one big smack, I have to say that, yeah, there was one big one in Truvanamalai where, um, actually there was a few of them, but one comes to mind right now, seems to tie in with this, uh, where, whereby there was a seeing that everything I do, everything I do is an obstacle Mm -hmm. from, from the truth, which is there and complete and beyond complete. And there all the time, everything I do is an obstacle. Um, So, so it's hopeless because every step I take towards it is moving me further away. Mm -hmm. And that felt that, that, that was the pits. 
that really was helpless, hopeless. I'm the problem. I'm the obstacle, the doer, whatever is trying anything, doing anything at all. And so that realignment to allow movement and doing to come from another place had to happen. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense of going mad because the idea of, of being in control of any action came up and had to be destroyed and I had to abandon it. It had to be abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, there was a seeing that, that gosh, uh, uh, every time that a body moves, there's a piece of energy. It was an energetic seeing. It was a little bit like a, like a trippy vision, actually, but mm -hmm. I was very sober, very clean these days. Um, there was a sense of like, even if somebody's arm moves, there was an energetic seeing that there was a piece of energy here that was pulling it up. You can imagine that you're volunteering to raise your arm. But actually, actually, there's a piece, a pocket of energy creating, which creates a vacuum. And the body responds to it mm -hmm. by pushing against it. It's like, whoa, this is one huge, just one piece of, of energy. And that the parts within it are only seen because of identification with the body. Mm -hmm. So can I move from identification with the body to a perception, a perception of the body in order for body management to happen without mm -hmm. a controller being behind this mechanism? And so there was a seeing of, well, this is how consciousness moves. And then there's the impersonal and then there's the personal. So, so consciousness must be doing this pure perception. And am I that? I can be that. But actually, that's not real either. That's not real either. Mm -hmm. so, so these, um, I, I suppose, layers of perception were organizing themselves in India in, in, at this time around Arunachala, around that sacred place, you know? Mm -hmm. When you returned from India, were you able to integrate these realizations um, mm. into mm. your life? And where did it go for you from there? Yes. <clears throat> Everything flatlined. Um, and... I, perhaps it flatlined too because there was a diligence that was ensuring that every movement came from an organic place, not from not not being motivated by the thinking mind. Mm -hmm. And that practice, perhaps that practice was a rewiring of the mind in some way, mm -hmm. and looking now at neuroplasticity and seeing how that links in to, to states of meditation and states of the impersonal and awakening mm -hmm. to see what happens actually in the brain. I think a lot of rewiring happens because of spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. So it has its place. It certainly has its, had its place here. There was a great value, phenomenally a value, in, in the exercise to allow consciousness only or the working mind, not the thinking mind, to motivate every action. Mm -hmm. As a result of that practice, there was a flatlining, complete and total mm -hmm. flatlining. Nothing was noticed unless somebody else would point it out. Nothing at all. There were no nighttime dreams, no daydreams, no thoughts unless there was an interaction with the world uh -huh. that lasted for years. Back in the West, others saw it as being problematic, particularly my family, because they were concerned. Mm, understand. Um, yeah. And friends of mine that knew, knew what I was at, I suppose, more than your family. Your family get one side, really, don't they? Because the, the image of how you were runs strongly in memory. Mm. And so then they thought I'd lost the marble, my marbles probably, you know? But, but so, so they were concerned, what are you going to live on? Where are you going to live? What? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It'll happen. It's happening. It's fine. You, you know, because there was like, well, why would I, why would I even bother thinking about that? Mm -hmm. So this flatlining is fine if you're in a protected, safe environment, right. like an ashram or you're in a place that works in that way. There's something in the earth in India that, that allows that kind of 
serendipity that yeah that cause and effect when something something is is needed something comes in to respond to it really quickly mm -hmm. in india it just works like yeah. that in the west not so sometimes it comes in but but you know you can starve in the meantime <laughs> yeah. you know the right it takes some time very often for things to come right in the west we seem to have a lot of interferences with that with that call and response it's true mechanism you know, it, so it's not that simple. And so I would find myself sick, you know, in, in, in Dublin and a friend of mine like knocking on the window, Jack, are you all right? Are you all right? You know, I'm like, oh, no, I've been sick for a few days. And I'm like, Jeepers, come on, girl, you know, and, and get me well. And, and thankfully, of course, there's always something there to support you. Mm -hmm. But what, what came about was like flatlining, flatlining in the West Something has to crank up here. I have to develop some new wiring mm -hmm. to, to cope in the West, to be able to f f function. A, a functioning aspect of my mind got, got destroyed. I went too far. Mm -hmm. Fine if I, if, if I was to live in India, but it didn't happen. I'm chucked back here in the West. So what to do now? Yeah. So, so there's a sense, and it's still ongoing, of, of how to manage in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm being totally totally yanked back in or the jack character is being pulled back in to the world uh -huh. you know ended up getting married this year it's like really oh really really this form is going to get married you're kidding you know like how in the heck could that happen it, <laughs> there's too many components that have to click in there <laughs> but of course it, it, this is I, I can see now the trajectory of the jack character mm -hmm. the reintegration into the west it has to happen, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a rewiring. There's a rewiring of the functioning mind because the flatlining, it's not appropriate for the West. It's not. Fine if you're in a protected state. Fine if you're, I don't know, Yeah. retired. You've got an ashram around you. Mm -hmm. You've got a community around you. But it doesn't seem to be like that for this Jack character. There's always movement and change. And, you know, that's just yeah. how she is. Mm -hmm. Jack, could you say that life is living you instead of you having so much control over it at this point yeah there's there's no me consciously living my life there's there's entertainment from seeing how it happens mm -hmm. from really from a movie perspective do you know mm -hmm. uh there's there's an inability to take the jack character seriously there's no connection between what I am and her. Uh, what's living the Jack character? Yeah, life force. Consciousness operates, op is operating the whole ship, you know, the whole cosmos. Mm -hmm. Because that's the manifestation of consciousness. And so, and so that has this bundle of energy called physical form of Jack as part of its movement. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing that disconnects that disconnects this form from the movement of consciousness. There is no separation, there's no particularization of consciousness lessens here or gets diluted here and here the Jack character appears. It's not so. Mm -hmm. it, it's that the fullness of consciousness does every single thing through this form. Uh -huh. We can call it consciousness, universal energy, life force. Right. The idea of a of a disconnect of where it stops and I I start is nuts. It's like that's ridiculous. There's nothing other than consciousness appearing in different forms. Yeah. The forms are the appearance, and consciousness is 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 a more valid appearance, but still an appearance. Mm -hmm. Um. The, the ability to be one part of it, to be the Jack character. I haven't seen that for years. I haven't seen that for years. For the lack of language, you know? Yeah. Th that, that idea hasn't been plausible for years. It's in the ridiculous box. Mm -hmm. And so, so me as consciousness, yeah, phenomenally, I'm consciousness. I'm consciousness. Mm -hmm. Everybody and everything. I'm all of it. Yeah. There is a localization of perception. And functioning through this form. Mm -hmm. 
because every individual particle has its own uh, perception modality, perception mm. mechanism. But but that's just like that's just like a funky little twist in the tail. That's not integral to the workings of consciousness. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not integral to the workings of consciousness. That's the difference. Yeah. Well, what is integral to the yes. workings of consciousness? And what does it encompass from your view? Within itself, it has a capacity to be aware of itself. Mm-hmm. External to itself, it cannot be seen. So it cannot see the fullness of itself without a perception that is post the concept of consciousness. Da, 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 da. I better find other words for that. <laughs> if we look at localized perception and conscious and consciousness as an aspect of all of it, then the localized perception has the ability to see all of it. But the localized perception is within all of it. So consciousness can only be explored from within itself. And so as far as we can get is unity consciousness, where the unit of of pure awareness, pure consciousness, where it can be aware of itself is from within localized perception. Uh Okay. Now, conceptualization is where the concept of consciousness starts. Mm -hmm. Prior to conceptualization is what I am. That's what I am. Take consciousness away and what I am is not touched. So consciousness needs itself to perceive itself because consciousness Consciousness itself arises with the concept, with the first concept. And so saying that I am prior to consciousness, prior to all of it, can only happen within consciousness, which is a funny little paradox. Interesting. Because prior to all of it, there is no consciousness. Consciousness can only talk about itself from within itself. That's the magic of it. Yes. Well, Jack, the uh, subject of consciousness has proven to be a rather slippery one for many. I know it has for myself. How does one begin to bring this home for oneself and begin to live it? Mm. Yeah. Because I think, you know, being fully human is actually what happens when the personal and the impersonal and the observer and all of that is seen through. Being human is what's left. Yeah. Being fully human. That's, that seems to be what, what's going on here is mm-hmm. being fully human because it, it, movement comes from, doesn't come from the Jack character, you know? Mm. It, comes, it, it comes from something behind behind or outside or like above and behind up there, you know, uh-huh. movement kind of comes through like that. And I, I don't know. I, I, mm-hmm. Okay. Developing a total trust for what resonates deeply within. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a great tool. It's, you know what, actually, James, it's like a toolkit, a toolkit is actually what helps more than anything uh-huh. to have a good toolkit then you then you can use anything you can use buddhism on a monday and you can use non-duality on a friday uh-huh. and and be fine you know yeah. now i'm not talking about some but i'm not advocating like the the spiritually immature to chop and change like this at all mm. but it's more about a toolkit so that you can so that you can feel into that knowing of, of when something is appropriate or useful. Mm-hmm. The immature seeker will take a concept and grab a concept onto their life. Yeah. The mature seeker will have a tool 
a, a toolkit internally to know, ah, that concept is bringing understanding. I'm not interested in it as a concept, but it's bringing an understanding. Mm-hmm. So, so, so to feel when an understanding cracks, that is a great tool. Mm-hmm. That's a great tool. It's like, whoa, something was seen. An understanding came. Go after those. Go after those. Mm-hmm. So, so there, there are certain things that, that, that one can use to make use of everything that's out there. Uh-huh. Make use of everything that's out there. You know? Yeah. Jack, um, about 18 years ago now, I had made a trip to India where I had uh, spent some time there with a man by the name of Punjaji. We called him Papaji. And he gave me a teaching while I was there. And um, to this day, I, I feel that it was the best teaching that I'd ever received in my life. And that teaching came in two words. And he said, just stop. Yes. And I really didn't know what that was at the time, but I, I really felt it uh, deep yes, within my yes, own yes. being. And it just felt so direct. It felt like some sort of path away from all the suffering that I'd uh, previously experienced in my life. Yes. Um, So I'm not sure why I I told that story, but um, I just wanted to share that with everyone. Yes. Sometimes for myself... It feels like it's the best thing to do is to just throw everything down, all of the mind activities, the physical activities, and Stop. and to and to see what non doing is about. Yes. yes, and stopping. Yeah, Jack, how do you uh, begin to work with someone or point them in some direction? for those who come to be with you and uh, hear you speak? Uh, the format we use um, is uh, we use a questionnaire's chair because, because no two paths are the same. And while there, at the start of satsang, there's actually almost always now, I think, there's uh, just some talking that tends to come through. It might last for five minutes or 20 minutes, just talking, pointing, 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 pointing. And some people say, I wish I'd have just left after that 20 minutes. I wish I'd just left. <laughs> <laughs> but, and that's fine. But, but there's living in the world that has to happen. Yeah. So, so, you know, if if that brings somebody to a state of peace, it's like it's a state, you know, it's a state, mm-hmm. it's an opening, it's a great relief. And of course it has a place because it 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 yeah, yeah. there's a touching of home, of outside of all of it. Mm-hmm. But you know, you you go home and you you found whatever that you're you know, you're somebody broke into your car or broke into your house, and it's like, well, where's your happy state then? You know, where's mm-hmm. your peaceful peaceful state then? Mm-hmm. And they're just states of mind. They're just experiences. And, and they have their place, but it's not good enough. It's just not good enough, you know? So with the questionnaire's chair, there seems to be a, a skill that, that, that came in with the clairvoyancy of when somebody, when somebody is talking, there seems to be an ability to see the belief system that's holding all of that in place, whatever they're talking about, it's the belief system I'm after. Mm-hmm. So with, with uh, going after what's behind the story, you'll find that, that any story can be on top of it, mm-hmm. you know? And people are talking about their relationship with their child, but it's actually like, no, 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 this you think is about your child. It's not about how you relate to your son at all. It's, it's actually a belief system you're holding about something else. Mm-hmm. And so... 
so that's what I tend to do is whatever the story, go for what's behind of it, behind it. What, 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 uh-huh. what is solid that is making you think that this is your life? What, what is holding you in the hypnosis that you are an individual and you've someplace to go? That's what I'm after. What's holding you? And we dissolve that, you know, through understanding, you know, mm. sometimes through a practice, sometimes you, know, you just know that like some people it's like they're too interested in life. It's like go back into life. Life has to be lived. Experiences need to happen. Yeah. Not everybody is on the spiritual path actually is ready for it to finish. Yeah, it's true. Really, it, there's, you know, it, and that's fine. That's fine. Some people are just really interested in it intellectually or personally or this lifetime is about a load of growth, you know, or uh, the ego coming to wholeness or it's like, there's no big deal about about when it's over. It's like, so what? So what? Yeah. But I suppose there, there's, a, there's a movement that happens around the Jack character. And, and movement is comfortable for some and not comfortable for others. Mm-hmm. You know, um, just to dissolve the hypnosis. After the hip, dissolve the hypnosis, because what you are is there all the time. It's there all the time. Do you need a pointer to access it? Sure, but but you're going to keep needing pointers unless you've dissolved the magnetism that pulls you back into your own story. Mm-hmm. You see, so so there's two things going on. It's like okay, we we can talk you out there, but if you're pulled back into life, well, you know, heck, you've got a bit of unraveling to do. Why are you still interested in it? Yeah. What is still engaging? That 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 you'll go back into the movie, no matter how much suffering is in it, you'll go back in. Why? Why on earth? Are you still interested in it? There can be understanding on that for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. How could suffering be a pointer in itself Mm. in light of the immense suffering that uh, the human being is capable of experiencing? Yes. Yes. How can that suffering in itself point us in some direction yeah. or, or reveal something to us yeah does it have a purpose physiologically when when suffering happens its imprint is five times stronger than when something happy joyful positive happens mm-hmm. um i got that from some Neuro, neuroscientists who did some research and showed a load of slides on it. I don't know if it's on mm. a TED Talk or something. I don't know where I saw it. Mm. But, but so if the brain registers five times stronger than a positive, we're going to keep going back to the painful stories. Uh-huh. So, so there's an exaggeration of pain and suffering there must be an exaggeration because it registers five times stronger the same experience. Mm-hmm. So if you've got suffering, a suffering incident, if we could, you know, say five utils of suffering and five utils of joy and happiness, mm-hmm. you're going to remember this. You're going to remember this five times more frequently than this. Mm-hmm. It creates a stronger story. And, and with that understanding alone, it's like, gosh, this is just the wiring of our brains. Mm-hmm. Brains can be rewired. That's for sure. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. And But it's, it's just like, because we haven't been taught how to use the mind, we keep reverting to the story story, to, to the suffering story. And as a result, as a result, that impacts on the body and it impacts on your energy field. And what does it do? It's a magnet for more suffering. Mm-hmm. Because like attracts like. So, so, from a pure scientific point of view, if until we learn how to manage our minds, suffering will always be more attractive, naturally more attractive, magnetically more attractive. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the other thing is that suffering, suffering motivates us. Uh-huh. It motivates us to, to interaction, to do something. Now, there is an organic movement within that will function just fine it won't be after i need this to be better because i don't want to suffer Mm -hmm. 
even if that motivation goes, there is a movement towards that which is good. And suffering doesn't need to be there in order to motivate you to get something better. Mm. But as long as subconsciously or even consciously you think that suffering is pushing you on or is the thing that makes you move towards healing or towards what is good, then in a way suffering is on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. It's like you need it in some way. So it's an interesting thing to like, to do nothing for a few days and sit and see what your body will move, it, see what movement will happen. You'll find you'll make a phone call, you'll find you'll do the shopping, you'll find that you'll cook, mm -hmm. you'll find that functioning will come from another place. There won't be an avoidance of suffering or trying to heal the suffering or a rumination on suffering because this imprint goes in so deeply. Mm -hmm. So there, there, you know, it has, it's structured differently, suffering is, physiologically. So you can say, well, then I'm a victim of my suffering. It's like, heck, you know, we can learn how to manage the mind. With some understanding, we can see why suffering registers so deeply. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes suffering is so deep that you, you can arrive at a place of flicking a switch and where it actually just breaks. Sometimes you have to backtrack out of suffering, walk backwards and heal it and heal it and practice and whatever. And sometimes it's just so deep that click. The thing that creates that click most often is laughing at yourself because suffering and humor mm -hmm. are not friends at all. There is no humor in suffering. There's no humor. And so humor is the antidote to that complete suffering. Mm -hmm. So when you're completely and totally lost, helpless, hopeless, no matter what you can do, you're in there with this victim, really. Mm -hmm. Being in there at the, in the depth of that. If there is an opening and a willingness to disregard the value of suffering, the importance of suffering, mm -hmm. then we have an opportunity for, for humor to come in. If it's okay to laugh at the ridiculousness of your own sob story, at the ridiculousness of the all about me, death and pain and all me and look what happened to me and it's yeah. all so horrific and how will I ever get over it and I'll ever be healed. If you can just see how pathetically ridiculous that is. If that vision can come in, if that perspective can come in, it's not a dismissing of suffering. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's not about dismissing it. It's about a shift in the energy because suffering cannot exist with humor. And if the ridiculousness of your own story can be seen, it loses its importance. It breaks. And energetically, humor, it seems to just shake. It shakes the hold that suffering has on us. Uh -huh. There's a few little ways around it, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Jack, is suffering an inevitable derivative of pain. I think about uh, people who are experiencing really deep pain on some level. What would a wise one's relationship to, say, a deep physical pain look like? Physical pain. Physical pain. Yes. You might have to ask a wise one. <laughs> <laughs> Physical well, pain. Don't look at me. <clears throat> the body's in pain. The, yeah, the body's in pain. But the sufferer, the body doesn't suffer. You suffer. You become the sufferer. But the body's in pain. Let the let the body be in pain and there'll be a movement to try and heal it or rest it or protect yourself or whatever. You know, you, you guard the part of the body that's in pain. <clears throat> but the sufferer is when there's ownership of the pain. Let the ownership be with the body. The body is in pain. What are you making it yours for? This is what we do, huh? I'm in pain. I have a toothache. I, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like, no, the body is suffering. Let the body do its thing. The body's trying to heal itself. That's why there's intense physical pain, because it's trying to heal itself. Mm -hmm. 
That's the body mechanism. Don't make it yours. Don't make it yours. Mm -hmm. It's the ownership is what will make it turn pain into suffering. Uh That's why humor will break will break emotional suffering, particularly. Mm -hmm. You know, humor will break it. I don't know. Will humor break physical physical suffering? No. Ownership. Ownership will break physical suffering. Ownership of the body. And emotional suffering, humor will break it. Mm -hmm. Jack, what does it really mean to be um, completely honest with oneself on one's path? That seems to be something that's very important to do for oneself, doesn't it? Yes. It resonates here as being central. In spite of what what influences would come from others or advice that would come from others or others' perceptions, they're just perceptions. Mm -hmm. Let them be of interest. But you you got to make decisions for yourself. Absolutely. When you make decisions for yourself, taking in whatever influences and advice comes, but make the decision for yourself, once that is established, then it is seen that, gosh, when I'm making decisions for myself, something else is deciding, actually, something that is deeper or more, more wise than the personality, mm-hmm. than the character. Something else is making the decision for me, but at last I'm listening. Yeah. And it feels like that for the character, that at last you're listening. So <clears throat> the responsibility isn't a heavy thing at all. It's just an ability to respond. Mm-hmm. But by responding from a place of as, as honest, as true as you can be to your own inner knowing. Mm-hmm. And the more true you are to your own knowing, the more that can be honored and that your action can come from there. Yeah. Something, there is space for something else to break through. Because mind isn't making that decision. Because mind's job is to be true to thine own self. <laughs> to be true to, to something, the deepest part of you. Honor that. Mm-hmm. And you'll find, I'm scared of what others think. I lose popularity. I lose, I lose, I lose. It's like, yeah, you will. That's mm-hmm. the perception to keep mind in charge. Mm-hmm. Be prepared to lose it all. Go there. Go there, go there, go there. It's fine. Doesn't matter if you're ridiculed and ridiculed it, do, it doesn't matter let these things come so what mm-hmm. what's more important what's more important you know just yeah. to be accepted or seem to be doing the right thing or to really really honor and to learn which could be the hard way but to learn the hard way at least you know that from deep within that sense of listening is getting deeper mm-hmm. is is that the direction is coming from something that is not your thinking mind that will only operate out of fear anyway and wanting to be accepted and that, 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 that operates out of there. Being true to, 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 to the deepest knowing that you can find. If you don't know what to do, don't do anything until there is a movement from someplace else. Mm-hmm. What do you think would be the ideal relationship for one to have with their everyday thoughts in light of the seemingly problematic consequences that our thoughts seem to have on us at times? It largely depends on where one is at. Um, if, if, If thoughts are in charge of the show for most of the day, then the practice of observing the thoughts and just say, oh, that's a thought, that's a thought. Okay, I'm not going to obey that. Let's see what happens. That's just a thought. I'm not going down there the more often one can pull back from thoughts, the better. And it's the frequency with, 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 within what, it's the frequency of how often somebody can pull back, not how long you can stay back observing, because you'll only probably stay back observing for a few seconds, actually. So, but with the frequency, you'll find, gosh, I don't get pulled in at all into thoughts. Thoughts aren't in charge. They just rise up every now and then when they're needed. That's where that practice will go, which is great. It brings some peace. 
So that's that's for one group of people, maybe. Mm-hmm. For another one is don't own any thought at all. Just don't own any thought. Uh-huh. So thoughts are there. They're fine. They're just thoughts. Don't let them be yours. They come and they go. They're not yours anyway. Unless, unless you buy them and you're invested in them and the story is of interest, then it's yours. But it's like you've pulled it off your shelf to make it of interest to you. And now it influences your perception and how you see the world is influenced by this thought. Mm-hmm. Perception can happen without buying any thought. Yeah. Without buying any thought at all. Just perceiving. Nothing much going on. So not to own any thought allows them to be there. Mm-hmm. The other one is, is to separate back and pull back from them. Just to observe them. Some thoughts just repeat, 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 repeat. And those ones you can do neither with. Mm-hmm. Those ones need resolution. And that's where there's usually a lack of self-love behind those ones. Mm-hmm. There's usually something unresolved there. Something that's the all about me pain is active there. Yeah. For ones that keep, keep repeating and keep coming up. It's like that's when you dig to the bottom of that, there'll be a lack of self-love, lack of self-acceptance. That's what will be there. So for some, that's the only way, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, Jack, before we come to the end of our little conversation here, is there anything else that you would be willing to share with us that could perhaps provide some direction for us in these matters of life and consciousness? Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? <clears throat> yeah. Nothing is coming. That's okay. Okay, it's like an, an add-on to the, to, the, to the last question about how to deal with thoughts. Um, it's like a, a, a Western modification, I suppose, of using mantras from other traditions. Mm-hmm. Um, a sentence that would challenge a core belief is a very useful thought to run. Mm-hmm. So running an idea like, there is no personal I. There is no Jack. There is no James. To run this a gazillion times, like there is no personal lie, so that it's just going as a loop. There is no personal lie. Mm -hmm. This can be really effective. It can bring an understanding. It's like, oh my God, there is no personal. And it feels totally different when the understanding comes. Uh But it's, it works for a lot of people. It's a little trick. I don't know what it is. It's, it's like if you tell mind something often, often enough, I suppose it surrenders its contrary belief. Mm-hmm. And, and mind tends to surrender. It's not that it believes that there is no personal I. It doesn't believe that. But it creates a chink whereby an understanding of like, jeepers, there isn't really. I have to create a thought for there to be a sense of a personal I here. Whoa. Is there really an autonomous personal lie running all the time? Or is there an assumption that there's a personal lie running all the time? Mm-hmm. Um, things like that are useful. But they work for some and not for others. And the thing is to try it. And yeah. If it doesn't resonate, you know, if it doesn't resonate, it doesn't resonate. But if it's persisting, hey, use it. Mm-hmm. Um, and wherever, wherever one is at is where one has to be at. You know, there's, there's a, an exquisite fineness to how this is playing out. Mm-hmm. You know, and... and to want the suffering to end, to, well, if you really, 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 really were done with it, it would be done. It would be done. Yeah. It would be done. So have the experiences while they're there. Why not? You know, have the experiences until it just doesn't do it for you anymore. You know? Yeah. Just let it all play out. Yeah. Let it play out. Let it play out. Yeah. And if there's a fire in your belly like there was for this character, heck, what can you do? You know, you got to go with that. <laughs> but, but if that yeah. fire isn't like making you go to whatever, satsang, read books, listen to stuff, if it's not obsessively taking over, heck, you know, let it play out. 
it's all right. Mm-hmm. It's all right. Let it play out. Let the softness come in, you know. All okay. Yeah. It's just going to do its own thing anyway. Whether or not you imagine you're running the show or not running the show or in charge or not running out, char- not in charge, these things are superimposed upon a natural flow which is as organic as the sun coming up in the morning, you know. Mm, absolutely. It's fine. It's doing its own thing with or without your help. You know? Yeah. Well, Jack, thank you so much for speaking with us here today. Thank you, Jake. It was wonderful. Yeah, that was a fun chat. I know you come to France, and um, if you're ever back here again, I hope you stop by. Perhaps we can... <laughs> um, have another one of these conversations. <laughs> yeah, might do. I tend to go there every year and, and do a residential res- re- retreat, like southwest of Paris, um, a residential silent retreat for six days. That's great fun. Yeah. Yes, I saw where you do a retreat here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Could you give us your web address? Yeah, it's jack-o'keefe.com. Okay, thank you. And I see you're going to be presenting at the Science and Non-Duality Conference as well, which is a big event. Uh Uh-huh. Yes, the one in California. Mm -hmm. All the best to you, Jack. And like I said, I I hope we can do this again someday. Um, Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you for the opportunity, James. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> if you'd like to join us for upcoming episodes of the Archaic Drum Podcast or receive updates on our website content in general, you can go to www.archaicdrum.com and sign our mailing list. We're also to be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Thanks so much again for joining us for the Archaic Drum Podcast. Beat by beat, evolving self and society through ancient wisdom and emerging paradigms. Mm-hmm.